Support for this episode of Judaism Unbound comes from the Ashman family JCC in Palo Alto, California, whose vision is to be the architects of the Jewish future. The Ashman family JCC empowers you to experience Jewish paths toward a life of joy, purpose, and meaning through innovative Jewish learning and wellness programs, community building, and initiatives to develop the next generation of Jewish leaders. Learn more at www.paloaltojcc.org. This is Judaism Unbound, episode 269, Shabtai Tzvi, Permitting the Forbidden. Welcome back, everyone. I'm Dan Liebenson. And I'm Lex Rothberg. And today we are doing something of a crossover episode. We're going to talk about what that means in a couple of minutes, but suffice to say that this episode of Judaism Unbound is also going to be released on the podcast of our guest today. Our guest today, Chava de Cordova and Michael Sokolovsky, host their own podcast called Chai, How Are You? It bills itself as the world's first queer Talmud podcast, on which queer Jews Chava de Cordova and Michael Sokolovsky play with the multi-millennial dialect that is the Talmud. As they put it, join them as they throw drosh, seek prophetic insight, and uncover the rabbinic smuttiness inherent in the system. They recently did a series of episodes on Shabtai Tzvi, who is known to Jews who've heard about him as a false or a failed messiah. We're going to get into the details of whether that's actually the best way to understand him. But it was a fascinating series of episodes that we're going to be picking up on in this conversation as a point of connection between our conversations on the Bible that we've been having and the next set of conversations that we're going to be doing on the trans experience in Judaism. Chava de Cordova is a longtime Svara-style Talmud learner. That's the style of studying created by our many times guest, B'nai Lappi, and her organization, Svara. And Chava is a Svara-style Talmud learner who got her start as a teacher by creating Beit Midrash Behind Bars, an organization that facilitated Jewish learning opportunities for incarcerated people in Washington state. She is also the co-founder of Shalmala, an online-first queer yeshiva. Michael Sokolovsky is a lapsed software developer from a Russian Jewish family who, quote, fell down the Talmud rabbit hole when they decided to help Chava make a podcast. Outside of making meaning from Jewish mythology, Michael also enjoys playing guitar for contra dances and creating other audio projects that explore the human condition. So this would be the point of the introduction where we would normally say welcome to our guests, but they have a little bit of a different way to start their show. So Lex, I'm going to throw it to you to get us going here. Well, the throw is hereby caught, uh, thrilled to be thrown to, and thrilled to have this incredible crossover experience. Yeah, for for those who haven't been so immersed in crossover episodes of whatever mode, I do think, you know, many people have experienced what that's like. But basically, you know, we've got two podcasts in one here today, where Chava and Michael have their podcast, Kai, How Are You? Dan and I have ours, Judaism Unbound, and... For all intents and purposes, this episode is both of those things. It is not of one as opposed to the other. We're both. And um, we're therefore kind of in this guest situation, all four of us, while also being a host situation. But, uh, you know, listen in and see see what you think our roles are. I don't even know what my role is in the world. So, like, guest, host, Lex, what am I? Anyway, when I think about crossover episodes, I always flash to the Jimmy Chimmy Power Hour, a classic of Nickelodeon history, where Jimmy Neutron and the Fairly Odd Parents had an epic crossover in the early 2000s. Um, but we are doing a crossover of our own. We're thrilled to have Chai, How Are You here? We're thrilled to be here or be had in Chai, How Are You space, whatever the right words are. Chava and Michael, I'm going to start with a question that you always start with, but Hi, how are you? <laughs> uh, I will, I'll take the first swing at that question. How am I? As longtime listeners of the show may know, uh, Baruch Hashem, uh, which for people who haven't heard me define this before, Baruch Hashem is a Hebrew phrase that literally means bless the name. And it's uh, a sort of <laughs> an easy way to get out of answering how you really are by just thanking God <laughs> for whatever is happening to you. But yeah, I'm doing well been getting really excited for this episode, been thinking a lot about the Timmy Jimmy power hour and its mm. meaning for Jewish culture and which characters in it are Jewish, which I, for me, I feel like Sheen is the only standout. His full name is Kidu Sheen. <laughs> That's a little Talmud <laughs> reference. It's a section of Talmud for those interested. Yep. Oh, 
Oh, wow. That's funny. But yeah, I'm well. I, you know, I've just been spending all morning um, getting ready for this by reorganizing my Animal Crossing island and not paying attention to what's happening in the world at all. Um, Michael, hi, how are you? How am I? Um, I'm fine. I'm doing fine. Um, <laughs> you we can so really fine. tell. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. You say Baruch Hashem. I, I just, I just act sad so then people don't, you know, pry too much. That's kind of my style. But uh, I, I was, I, I don't know anything about Jimmy Neutron, but the Nickelodeon character that I relate to the most is the alligator from Clarissa Explains It All. <laughs> wow we've got deep cuts here for non-millennial listeners i don't apologize i'm very very thrilled that this is how we're starting our episode but clarissa explains it all look it up good times um it's a tractate of nickelodeon yes yeah 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 that's right alex how how are you how are you doing i'm doing great and uh i actually am doing great i was doing terrible earlier this morning because i had some really ridiculous stuff related to my car um they told me i was gonna have to go to the dmv but also that i couldn't go to the dmv because of covid um <laughs> so that's like a fun situation but then i didn't really have to go to the dmv i figured out a solution so i'm in a much better place now than i was a few hours ago but right now i can say i'm doing great because i like i, I had an achievement today i like dealt with car problems and wow. have made the next stage so i'm thrilled that makes me think, like, is there is there any, like, Kafka-esque bureaucratic nightmares that happen in, in the Talmud or, or like, in... in, in uh, Isn't the in whole the... thing that? Isn't that, like, the whole... <laughs> Isn't the whole Jewish people... What is the Jewish people if not a Kafka-esque nightmare persisting? Right. Yeah. Last, hi, how are you? Dan, how are you? I thought I was really good. I was excited about this episode because <laughs> of, I've been listening to Hi, How Are You for the last few days, and I'm really excited to have this conversation. Then I realized like, I'm in a room full of millennials here, and I don't know what <laughs> y'all are talking about. And for me, a crossover episode is The Love Boat and Fantasy Island. So uh, I, hopefully at least some of our listeners can feel included in the conversation if I say something like that. Right. I mean, we've talked about inclusion language versus like acceptance language and empowerment language. Like, I want to say, Dan, we include you. And I mean that in exactly the way that we've talked about and no more. Um, All right. Because, you know, Abby Stein always says that tolerance is for lactose. And yes. I'm, feeling, I'm feeling that right now. Yes. We feel about you like we feel about lactose. I don't know. Um, no, this is I, so I, fun because no one ever asks you all how you are on your show. It's like you're you're these uh, sort of you. You're always giving, never receiving <laughs> the care. There you so go. I'm glad for your listeners to hear for the first time how you're doing as people. Yeah, we'll have to we'll have to check in a little more in the future. This is good. Um, so we should, in fact, start the I don't know the body of this <laughs> podcast episode. Here's like what the general idea is. I mean, we mentioned some of this in our little intro at the top of the show, but some of you fast forward through that to get to this, which is very understandable. Um, what we're doing is we just had this amazing unit of episodes where we talked about the Bible. And one of the things we talked about is the Bible is not really one book. It's, you know, a set of lots and lots of different authors and source material that some of it is, you know, over 3,000 years old, and some of it is barely a little over 2,000 years old. So it's like a huge stretch of material. And so in that spirit, where we talked about a thousand years in just a few episodes, we're also going to talk about a thousand years in this episode, just like from the Talmud, which is to say, you know, the beginnings of what is often termed the Oral Torah, early centuries of the Common Era through all the way up to a few hundred years ago, where we're going to talk about somebody named Shabtai Tzvi that all of us have very great positive thoughts about. So <laughs> that's... By the way, to be fair, that's about 1,700 years. Yeah. Well, if you count the mission... Yeah, I, I'm stretching the limits of, of this What's thousand 700 years. What's 700 years between friends? <laughs> oh, yeah, exactly. Exactly. So we're going to talk about a large stretch of time, um, and we're going to cover every date of that time. No, we're not, but it's going to be great. Um, so that's a little bit of framing. but. Before we get to the later part of that, I'd love to hear from the two of you. I mean, you have this amazing podcast. What is the Talmud? Like, give, a, give us a little bit of a, of a beginner's guide to this document or set of documents. And how do you go about learning from it and exploring it with folks? 
Yeah, Havel, what is the Talmud? <laughs> I'm not sure I know yet. I'll let you know if I figure it out. But really, seriously, um, what is a Talmud? Well, in the most basic sense, the Talmud is this big body of literature that is in a mixture of Hebrew and Aramaic that was written by, I mean, it wasn't written, it was composed orally by uh, a couple groups of people, the, the early rabbis who lived right at the tail end of the existence of the Second Temple and a few hundred years after that. And I like to think of the literature as sort of being their attempt to puzzle out how Jews would be living from here on out. But even more than a piece of literature, which is how I think most people think of the Talmud, uh, the Talmud is actually, or, or rather than saying the Talmud, Talmud is actually much more a process than a piece of literature. It's a certain way of engaging with Jewish problems and with problems in general that sort of stems out of our hundreds of years of cultural production. <laughs> and w the core of that production is that piece of literature that I just mentioned. On your show, you have this incredible back and forth. And Michael, I know you sort of, you bring this like aw shucks approach where you're like, oh, I don't really know that much about Talmud and Chava's teaching me and I'm learning along the way. And I think it's true. But I also am curious, given that, like, I think there's actually a power in hearing somebody who is not like big ticket expert, whatever, their definition of something. So like, how do you conceptualize the Talmud? In general, I, I have a tendency to not trust big ticket experts of of much it's just yeah. part of my personality so yeah. you know I, I like to and i i i hope i hope it comes through to listeners that we're both in in some ways beginners at different levels well i won't speak for hava but i'm a <laughs> beginner uh, for me the easiest way to say what talmud is is kind of like a, imagine okay this is th th this is what talmud is imagine a bunch of freshman year guys hanging out in a dorm room with each other and they're all trying to like figure out the utopia that they want to like create and build with each other because for whatever reason they're not satisfied with the current society that they're living with and they're all like hanging out with each other they're not hanging out with their girlfriends they're just like you know this is they're, they're all getting together in one person's dorm and just like hashing stuff out and 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 they're maybe trying to one up each other a little bit and do a little shop talk here and there and and this is just a big giant documentation of it that's lasted for hundreds and hundreds of years and so it has law you know opinions about what to do in certain situations but also stories and lore and like everything that you would assume if you had like a group of guys hanging out with each other and you know we're a queer podcast. Guys, I mean the most, <laughs> you know, gender neut neutral term, but I do associate this kind of pedantic one-upmanship quality with, with men in general. I was imagining when I was going to bed like a few days ago, like a movie where American democracy collapses, right? But there's this group of like 20 incredibly enthusiastic men who are all like really devoted to like the founding fathers and democracy and they're like really really sincere they're like so annoyingly sincere <laughs> and like america's totally destroyed and they're like well what do we do now we don't have like america now we need to like come up with like diasporic americanism and like we don't know what to do and i guess we'll just like hang out with each other and like maybe like have homoerotic experiences with each other while we figure it out. Like that's what the Talmud is. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if this is the, the most natural point, but I was actually listening to your podcast for the last few days, like I was saying, and Chava, I learned something about you and Michael, you didn't really tell your story, but I'm interested a little bit in, in the story of how you come to have a Talmud podcast, because I, I feel like the typical story is somebody who studied Talmud all their life and now they want to share it with everyone, you know, and you talked, Chava, on your podcast just about your own story, which I didn't know, which included that uh, an analogous story to Juan Mejia, who was one of our earlier guests, who is somebody that grew up and didn't know that they had Jewish ancestry, that they were Jewish and discovered that only in young adulthood, in your case, in older adulthood, I think, in one's case. I bring that out because the whole point of Judaism Unbound is to empower people who they don't feel authorized 
to bring their own full self into this grappling. And so it feels to me like all the more so, or there is a Talmudic concept called Kalva Homer, you know, this idea that if something is true in this case, then all the more so must it be true in that case. And so I'm kind of wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you just got so quickly from that place to having a Talmud podcast and being sort of one of, and it's not just that you you have a Talmud podcast that's like telling interesting facts about the Talmud. It's that you have a Talmud podcast where you're bringing your full self to it. You're basically saying, I'm reading the Talmud differently from how it's typically been read in the past. And that takes a lot of chutzpah, which we see as a good thing to come and say, you know, I'm really going to bring my voice into this very, very quickly in terms of my own life and my encounter with this. Sure. So as you mentioned, I am from a, a family that my ancestors way, way back converted when they were expelled from Spain. And so the Jewish ancestry in my family, I didn't even know about it until I was 13 or so. And my great grandmother told me and I didn't really do anything about it. I didn't really like pursue Judaism in any serious way, you know, for for many years after that. And then, uh, as fate would have it, I listened to your episode where you the first time you entered uh, interviewed B'nai Lappi for um, Svara, the queer Talmud organization that she founded. And a really funny story that I tell a lot in the Talmud world is that she said some stuff on that podcast that I found questionable. And I ended up writing this big open letter and she and I ended up having a couple calls and talking about it. And so I met B'nai Lappi through calling her out based on stuff that she said on your show. And she got me to come to my first queer Talmud camp. And, you know, I fell in love with Talmud from there. And I just really, I really wasn't expecting how much the sort of dry, logical, really challenging part of Talmud study would draw me in, but kept studying ever since that day. And then the the podcast really came about in a funny way, because at the beginning of 2020, I got very sick with a chronic neurological condition. And I was trying to think of some ways because I lost my job because of that. And I was trying to think of some ways to um, raise money so that I would be able to survive. And Michael had this idea of like, oh, I'll help you make a podcast and then you can just start a Patreon for it. So I didn't even know what it was going to be about. We were just going to make some podcast about whatever. So yeah, part of it was because Michael was just very ready to say, you know, let's make a podcast. And, you know, people think you have to be this special person to have a podcast, but it's, you'll find that once you start making a podcast, it turns out you're a podcaster and no one will ever <laughs> question that. So now Wait, don't I'm, give away the secrets here. <laughs> um, and of course, I have to give uh, credit. Lex and I have been study buddies for many years since the very, I mean, the very, very early days of Judaism Unbound is when. Lex and I met, which is a long time ago now, um, you know, and Lex yeah. has has been there with me every step of the way from before I could even read Hebrew. And that friendship has really instilled the chutzpah in me, <laughs> which I think I was born with a naturally high amount of chutzpah. But uh, Lex, Lex, my friendship and, and studying with Lex helped unleash that. So I think even knowing someone who had a Jewish podcast, I was like, well, I could do that. I mean, I know Lex and I can hang out with him. So therefore it'll be fine. <laughs> I love that. And I love, oh, this is very fun to share some, share some airtime with both of you. Um, hmm. I, I, I'm really excited to sort of get into what you do with Talmud. So like, like Dan said, it's not just that you have a Talmud podcast, it's that you have a Talmud podcast and you're, you're looking at particular sections of it and you're coming up with really I mean I don't want to say creative because that sort of implies that your your interpretations like aren't real like th they are creative but I, I mean that only in the sense that you're finding really important teachings and important lenses on the text that actually feel like oh that's been there the whole time and why didn't we see that and so I I'm curious like how that process works because I I'm curious about it both in the Talmud context which is this dry, it, it, in some sections, it's kind of a tough text, but I think part of what makes it nice is that because it's tough, there's a reward in finding those gems. Um, but I'm also curious about applying that 
beyond. So like, how do you do this with Tom? Like, what's your process of, of finding a part and being like, oh, we've got something to say here and then putting it out to the world? I think one thing is having faith in your own perspective and not feeling insecure in that you're not seeing something the way it like, quote, should be seen, unquote. Any large institutionalized or any large hierarchical or any large collection of of like art or, or you know, I, and I include religions in, in that category of art. It leads to insecurity on the part of some members of that community and and how they're allowed to participate. And I think just having faith in your own perspective is something that is, uh, I guess you could say, queer. And that's kind of the root of everything. And maybe like the analogy I would make is like if you ask a bunch of gay people, like gay in the most inclusive sense of the word gay, to look at Western art, they'd be like, wow, a lot of this art's like really gay or like really about <laughs> sex. But then if you ask a bunch of like straight people, I don't know about art historians. I don't know anything about them. But if you ask. They're all gay. You're at, yeah, they're all gay. <laughs> if you were to ask them like what they see in the art, they for some reason they'd miss the thing that's obvious that's like right in front of them and I, I don't know why there's this correlation between being an outsider and being able to see stuff that's right in front of your face like the emperor has no clothes kind of view and and being queer in, in, in a general sense but i think that's the general kind of approach and, and allows at least me to have the chutzpah like you said to make a podcast like this even though i really don't know much about Talmud or Judaism in general. I'm I'm very new to both. I think the the dynamic between Michael and I is really what makes it work, especially because you know because Michael is a, a little bit more of a beginner and Talmud. They see things even that I miss, you know, or that I accept. You know, they're willing to question those things, which is sort of part of the second thing that I think helps make the episodes interesting, which is that for us, everything is on the table to be questioned. Nothing is safe. That's a sort of attitude that has characterized Judaism at, at particular times in its history. I, I think in the early days of the Talmud in, in what we call the Tanaitic era, the era of sort of the first generation of rabbis who were making Talmud, um, they were incredibly creative, willing to question all Jewish culture that had come before them. And then Later in the more medieval period, we get to a real outgrowth of Jewish mysticism and the Zohar, which is a huge text of Jewish mysticism that you've talked about a little in previous episodes. And the, the mystics in the Zohar, you know, they were willing to question anything. And, and just periodically, Judaism and the Jewish people go through this cycle where suddenly we become willing to entertain the idea of everything being on the table to be questioned. And I think... We're entering one of those phases right now. Queer Talmud as a movement is a big part of that phase, and, and there are lots of other organizations and approaches. But I think we're sort of just moving into a time as a culture where people are more willing to re-examine ideas, even the sacred ones. I want to pick up on something that you were saying, Chava, about teaching. You know, you've created an organization devoted to teaching Talmud, and yet, I, I also wanted to say, like, you know, you like you said, it was a long time since you've known Lex and whatever. But like, from my perspective, maybe I'm old, but from my perspective, <laughs> that was five years ago. It's not that long. And I'm thinking like, wow, you know, five years or less after having been uh, introduced to Talmud, you've already created an organization that's teaching Talmud. And I'm just curious about a notion of what teaching is that naturally stems from that, that I think is somewhat different from what people assume, especially people assume it about Judaism. Why? I don't know. I find it very frustrating. It's my life's work to break it down. But you just recently did a three episode arc on this character, Shabtai Tzvi, who was a person who was believed to be the Messiah at a certain point. We're going to get into that later, I think. But you had an initial episode that was Michael speaking with a person who has another podcast called Historian Explaining, And I was so impressed with his explanation of Shabtai Tzvi. I mean, I learned more about Shabtai Tzvi from that episode, just on a kind of a factual basis, than I have ever known in my entire life. And I have had a lot of Jewish, you know, opportunities to learn Jewish things. And 
you created on that episode, but then on your other two episodes too, kind of like the best publicly accessible deep dive into this character of Shabtai Tzvi that has ever existed in the world. And basically it was a bunch of people that are what would be called amateurs in, in the world. And, and that, you know, professors would be, oh, well, they didn't know enough. They didn't have all the details right or whatever. And, you know, other people would say, oh, but there's deeper Jewish things and whatever. If we say that only such experts can teach and they don't teach, then that knowledge is basically locked away from regular people. So I'm just trying to kind of puzzle out, can we talk about how somebody can teach who themselves might be relatively new to the material and that's okay. And I, I'm wondering, I guess, if you teach Talmud classes and people ask you, well, you know, can you tell me something else where this is? And you just don't know. Like, how does that work? Because I, I really just want more people to have the chutzpah to do that. <laughs> okay. Well, there's a couple parts to this question. One thing I want to go back to is when you were talking about how, um, how long Lex and I have known each other, which is about five years, has felt very short to you. And I think this actually really influences my level of chutzpah. You know, there's this thing in the queer community that happens a lot because especially, you know, I'm a trans woman and trans women just, you know, have a lower life expectancy. That's just a fact. And I, there were many periods, especially in my earlier life, where it, I really felt that life expectancy very, it felt very immediate to me because of the precariousness of my circumstances. So to me, five years feels like an incredible length of time because there was a period in my life where I was like, I don't know if I'll live this month. Going on to the next question, uh, I'm very flattered that you would describe our, our Shabbatai episodes that way. I'm, I'm really proud of what we made there. And I do think you characterized it correctly. I think Sam pretty much researched for that episode and then created it right then. You know, there's this thing that uh, Lainey Solomon of Svara also told me once, which is that in the Svara method, all you have is your learning and your personality. A teacher is making their learning transparent to the class. So it's not about the knowledge base of the teacher. It's about the ability of the teacher to expose their process, which is incredibly vulnerable to a room full of people. And I think the podcast works much the same way. You know, we make this show and it's just Michael and I learning Talmud in front of everybody else. And when I'm teaching classes, you know, it comes up a lot. A lot of times I'm teaching classes to people who are much more Jewishly learned in the classical sense than me, you know, who ask me a question about Aramaic grammar. And I'm like, I, I, if you don't know, I don't know. And I think cultivating that ability to say, I don't know, is, is a really challenging but important part of my teaching process. And teaching the way that I do and, and the way that some other teachers in the SFAR method do, which is this idea of making your learning transparent, it's starting to help create spaces where people have that expectation that that's what a teacher is doing. So to me, you know, I come to a class full of 40 students who either this is the first time they've ever learned Talmud, which is such a blessing that I've been able to teach many first time students, or they've only been in queer Talmud classes before, which is that's 99% of the people I teach, and then 1% of the people I teach are people who have studied Talmud somewhere else. I try to always make it clear, like, I'm not at the front of the room because I'm the person who knows the most, you know, I'm, I'm at the front of the room because I'm willing to undergo this sort of bearing of my guts in front of everyone. So we've mentioned in passing this person, Sheb Tzvi, and I would like to now I mean, you'll, you'll get to model the explaining that we're talking about a little bit. I'd, I'd love to hear, first off, I do encourage people to listen to your episodes that already exist about Shabbatai fees. So if you really want a deep dive, listen to those on the Chai How Are You page. It's episodes, what, 54 to 56 or something? Some, somewhere on there. You'll see them. Uh, yeah. Just go to the page. And I think Shabbatai V is a glorious example of something I actually think is not always the case. I think sometimes our whole knowledge chutzpah thing is if you know more about a holiday or about a prayer or about whatever, sometimes that actually restricts your willingness to be creative because you think that there's the right words or you think there's the right choreography, whatever. I think Shabbatai Tzvi is not an example of that. If you know more about Shabbatai Tzvi and his escapades, um, <laughs> I think that is very likely to correlate with an increased willingness 
to play around with the material or whatever of Judaism. So I'd love to go there. Who was Shabbatai Tzvi? What drew all these people to see him in this very elevated way to the point of seeing him as a messiah? And why should we care about it? Why is it so important to your podcast that you put so much effort into this particular set of episodes? Shamdai Tzvi was this character who lived in the mid 1600s and you know he he was no one really particularly impressive as an individual before he was quote discovered by uh, who I would call his promoter Nathan of Gaza and he had these intense highs and lows of of mood and this intense mystical relationship to Judaism and we don't really know whether Nathan convinced him that he was the Messiah or whether he had that idea pre-existing, but eventually he became convinced of that idea himself and he started to build this incredibly transgressive movement around his Messiahhood, not just that, you know, being a Messiah is already breaking the order of the world enough as it is, but he really focused on this idea that because we were entering the messianic era, that everything would have to be reversed from the way it was before. You know, he came up with this classic blessing that people attribute to him, um, which that actually is maybe dubious that it was attributed to him, but it embodies the movement very well, which is the blessing, blessed are you, Lord, our God, ruler of the universe, who permits the forbidden. And so he would do all these, you know, these big rallies where he would transgress various Jewish commandments. And there was a lot of even gender role transgression involved. You know, I think a a big part of the reason, uh, at least some part of the reason that he started to gain so much popularity is because he endorsed women reading from the Torah, which especially in that time in traditional Judaism was not a thing that happened at all. Um, The long story short is that it built to a fever pitch to a point eventually where, um, the Sultan took notice of him and decided that he needed to be dealt with. And so he ended up converting to Islam, which we do not know. Also, we don't know whether that was a sort of forced conversion or whether it was a conversion out of genuine religious conviction. That's a question that's open to history. But he converted to Islam and the movement sort of started to fall apart after that. And so that span of a decade or so of Shabbatean fever is so interesting to us, I think, because it is another one of those times where people were willing to question every idea that came up. And if you talk to people about Shabbatai today, you know, even people who are normally sort of the most radical tend to adopt a sort of conservative anti Shabbatai movement because I think we get very touchy about this messianic issue. But Shabbatai's willingness to go there, so to speak, you know, to take anything, to take dietary laws, to take what gender of people can read from the Torah, to take, you know, making up new blessings, to take all of those things and say, like, it's fine, we're allowed to do it. That was incredibly appealing to people then. And I think it's, uh, it's appealing to people now. And that's why I think we should all, we should all learn from Shabbatai. The specific content that Shabbatai was bringing is appealing to us now, but also like this deeper thing is appealing too, where we kind of always imagine, I, I brought this up in a recent podcast where we kind of imagine we're, we're the most evolved, we're the best people uh, in time and history. And like everyone before us was really like austere and boring and repressed and all that stuff. <laughs> and it's nice to be reminded that like, that's not the truth. That's just our weird back projection. That's a myth that we're choosing to believe in. And it's nice to be reminded that, hey, these people who are I'm a direct descendant of like went totally crazy for this stuff. They were like, wow, they were really enthusiastic, probably more enthusiastic than I've been about anything in my life, potentially. And it's just it reminds me that I'm not on this just treadmill of progress, especially now. I think not only just for queer people, but for a lot of people in general, if if you believe that we're on this treadmill of progress and you look around the world and, you know, these past few years with COVID and, and, and whatnot, it, it can feel like, well, if this is progress, then it can feel very hopeless. So I, I think this it, it kind of it inspires hope even to just remember that our ancestors were enthusiastic about something 
And on top of that, they were enthusiastic, as Hava said, about like women reading the Torah. Like, wow, that's like that's gravy. What Michael was saying, I think it's really interesting. It, whether Shabtai Tzvi was the Messiah or not, what we do know is that a ton of people thought that he was and got very excited about it, right? And what that suggests is that they weren't too happy with the situation as it was before. And that may be just because they were oppressed and anti-Semitism, but it may be that they weren't so excited about Judaism uh, before, right? That it wasn't doing what they needed mm -hmm. and they were they didn't really have available to them an alternative. And all of a sudden there was this exciting alternative and they went for it. And that makes me think a lot about how a lot of times biblical scholars are saying, you know, in the Bible where it talks about that you shouldn't bow down to idols and everything, that's because people are bowing down to idols, you know? And why were they bowing down to idols? Because apparently they were getting more out of the idols than they were getting out of the monotheistic form of Judaism, whatever. And we are not necessarily, right, any one of us is not necessarily the descendant of the person who was, you know, finger pointing at those people saying, stop doing that. It's much more likely that we are the descendant of the person who was doing that. What do we do with the possibility that we have been raised to accept as, quote, the tradition stuff that was actually used as a cudgel against our ancestors? And I remember also that on your podcast, you were talking about how, and, and some of your other guests were talking about how it's kind of annoying that people who in all other ways are kind of, you know, not that observant and not that, uh, not that with the party line of Judaism and various things in their life, but they all agree that Shabtai Tzvi was a false messiah, you know, and, <laughs> and that kind of that somehow he should be uh, condemned as a false messiah. Now, I have a slightly different take, which is the reason that I think that Shabtai Tzvi was a false messiah is that I just don't believe that there's such a thing as a messiah, right? Like, I don't believe, I, so it's not, so he's no, no more, no less the messiah than anyone else, but I don't believe that, you know, the messiah is, is, is a real thing. So the question, as I was listening to, to you talk about it, the thing that I was trying to figure out for myself is like, okay, how do I, how should I feel about someone like Shabtai Tzvi, who on the one hand, I don't believe his claims to have been the Messiah, because I don't believe anybody's claims to be the Messiah. And yet what he unlocked in Judaism is of vast importance, which has been ignored because of this issue of him being condemned as a false Messiah. So the question, I, I'm wondering how you see it, or at least assuming that you were to see it from my perspective that nobody's the Messiah, then how do we look in a positive way at Shabtai Tzvi and, and the Sabbatean movement? What does it mean, I guess, is, if, to you? First of all, I would challenge your claim um, about f just because you don't believe in any Messiah necessarily makes him a false Messiah. That would imply that you believe that there's a true Messiah out there. No, no, right. That's what, that's, the point <laughs> but, is that um, I don't. Right. You know, there's a reason I chose to entitle the episodes of that series Failed Messiah. You know, what the Messiah is supposed to do is supposed to usher in this era of perfect peace and justice and, you know, spiritual renewal. And to that extent, you know, I don't think we have to say that he was a false Messiah. We can just say that he took on that task of trying to embody someone who would accomplish that goal. And in the end, he was unsuccessful, mostly for circumstances beyond his control, because I don't think any one human can take on that task. To me, it's very powerful because I feel like I share in that with him. I think every every Jew, every person, every one of us on this podcast right now are all failed messiahs who should be at least attempting to bring about that era, I think, of, of perfect peace and justice. And we just haven't been successful yet. So to me, that opens up the possibility of reading his claim about messiahhood in a new way and also putting yourself in sort of the direct path of learning lessons from that because you can see yourself as actually part of the same endeavor that Shabbatai was working on. I think the question of was Shabbatai the Messiah is similar to saying like, was James Dean a heartthrob? It's like... <laughs> Sometimes James Dean was a, like everyone seems to think he was and like he certainly pulled that persona off pretty well. And maybe if I was hanging out with him in a restaurant when he was alive, you know, and conversing with him, I wouldn't see the heartthrobness because it wouldn't be presented to me the same way. I think it's like being the Messiah is tapping into a certain energy, just like being a heartthrob or being a superstar is, is tapping into a certain energy like no one really is that 
persona. It just is a persona. And something about those personas are appealing to people. And some of them maybe speak to good qualities about us. And some maybe appeal to like worse qualities about us. And I think hopefully the Messiah one appeals to good qualities about us. I think we could have some listeners out there who are hearing this. I hope we and have they're some. Like, <laughs> uh, oh, we definitely listen, but like we could have some a subsection of our listenership who are hearing this and it's like, oh man, Dan, Lex, and now Chava, Michael, like, but Dan, Lex, you've done this thing before where you, you play this game and you look back at Jewish stuff and you say, ah, that figure that's not the good guy is actually the good guy. And that person that's the central figure and supposed to be good is not. And like, you just keep doing this. And like, uh, is your whole game just to say like everybody that's good is not and everybody that's bad is good? And I want to address that because it's something we, uh, I've heard at least sometimes in emails or whatever. And I want to actually sort of say yes. Like, uh, and it's not that I'm doing it for no reason, but I believe we are in a time of broken Judaism, for for lack of a better term. I think we, we are sufficiently broken with what our Jewish society is that if we're going to go about fixing it, the place to look is not people who were sort of the central figures and sort of comfortable in that center in Jewish history. It's people who specifically also saw brokenness and also took steps to do something about it. And so that is absolutely, that one of the ramifications of that is if I'm looking at Torah, if I'm looking at the book of Numbers, I'm going to gravitate towards Korach more than Moses. Korach being the guy who starts a big old rebellion against, in certain senses, against Moses. You could argue that it's not really that, but putting that as like, and when I look at the Talmud, I'm going to think about a figure like Elisha ben Abuya, who's marked as the other and who's marked as like this apostate or whatever. I'm gonna, And I'm going to see like, oh, what can we learn from that? person specifically because they were called an apostate. And then I'm going to look at Shabbatai Tzvi. Who, like, from my perspective, that's what the process has to be because those are the figures who are models for what I believe our place is right now in a state of brokenness. So I'm curious if you see yourself as doing that work also, or if maybe, I don't know if it would be less or more radical, like if, or if you still do see yourselves as heir to those mainstream central <laughs> figures too like like uh, help me think this through because I, I i'm a interested in like not being defensive i think in the past i've sort of said oh it's not just that i love korok and it, like i like some of the main characters too but i kind of want to stop doing that and say yeah i am i am in the game of looking to shabbatite svi of looking to the people doing folk religion that the rabbis hated of looking to korok of, like that's actually what i think we need to do and i don't want to be defensive anymore so i'm curious if that's your orientation one of my main life goals is sort of to augment the complexity and the intensity of Jewish experience. And uh, that's not in, in that goal is in no way served by if I made a podcast about how awesome Moses and Maimonides and all, all these other sort of classic good Jewish figures are, you know, we are we have enough material covering how awesome Moses is, you know, we have five whole books of it. And that's just not enhancing Jewish experience. We just have that material already. I think that when you make a sort of intellectual or spiritual ecosystem that it's one core you thing is the good guys, you know, the Moseses, that's a really unstable ecosystem of knowledge. If, so, if you find out Moses did something bad, which you will, um, that whole thing collapses. And that even is right, of course, part of what was going on with the rabbis when the second temple collapsed. You know, everyone was talking about how bad the other temple was, right? There was a temple in, in Elephantini in, in the Egypt sort of area, you know, and no one was into that bad guy temple. But maybe if we had been a little more into it, the temple ecosystem would have been a little more healthy, you know? And so... This impulse to go towards the good guys, it actually makes Judaism weaker. Lex, I was thinking like, like you're really into this idea of connecting to those characters that are read as bad guys, like a little bit more so than me. Like I, but so I'm, I want to say something like a little different here, which is that, and, and maybe it comes from the same impulse, but as I'm trying to like wrap my head around Shabtai Tzvi and what he's doing, I'm actually thinking that 
I want to put Shabtai Tzvi in a similar category to um, the early rabbis of the Talmud. And this is where I want to like maybe draw back around a connection between Shabtai Tzvi and the Talmud and to say that actually the, the early rabbis and Shabtai Tzvi were addressing very similar problems, which was the collapse of the previous Judaism. And in a way, I think I'm teasing out this question of whether just because of historical circumstances, because there had been a major physical destruction, the early rabbis didn't have to declare themselves the Messiah in order to do that work. They kind of had an empty ground to do that work because there was like nothing else. And they, so they rebuilt a new Judaism that basically overturned the Torah in many ways. We talk about that all the time with B'nai Lapi. Also, that market was taken at that era. Like somebody was, like there was a messianic claim. That, oh, well, yeah, yeah, good point. Maybe so. But I'm just saying that, you know, they, they overturned, you know, they're, they're, again, the they're Sabbatean prayer, blessed are you God who uh, makes the forbidden permitted. The rabbis were doing the same thing. It's just that they were kind of doing it a little bit uh, hush hush. I think in a very real way, the Shabbatean movement is the compost that Reform Judaism grew out of, not even in a sort of distant sense, but in a direct sense, like the Jewish Enlightenment was very much a reaction to the the spiritualism of the Shabbatean movement. Hasidism also has connections to the Shabbatean movement. Right. So, I mean, this is not, this is never a question that's really going to be resolved, but the, you know, I wouldn't even necessarily say that Judaism is broken or was broken. I would just say that Judaism is always breaking, much mm. like the rest of reality. That is, its fundamental quality uh, is one of impermanence. You know, our job as as Jews and, and as Talmud students is to learn how to make meaning, you know, in the midst of that breaking. And as soon as you make that meaning, it's going to break, you know. It's just a, a continuous cycle we'll we'll never get to a place where Judaism is is fixed and I think part of what draws me more to the Shabbatean flavor of that is that I feel like Shabbatai embraced that principle so openly not only embracing the brokenness of Judaism but embracing breaking it and saying actually breaking it is the thing of Judaism you know I feel like I'm I'm pretty out there in terms of Talmud scholars or teachers in the world. I feel like I'm pretty on the edge of what we're allowed to be. And even I wish, you know, I felt like there was room for me to be more, have more of that dramatic flair that Shabbatai had. So I'm, I'm always trying to bring that, that energy in because I think the, the sort of enlightenment side of it is well covered, well staffed. They're well staffed over there. Chava, you found Talmud and learned some Talmud, and you reached a point where you, like you described, were ready to engage in teaching of with others. You could have decided to do many things, and I get that Michael pushed towards, oh, podcast. Uh, we're here as four podcasters doing a crossover podcast. Why was that the route as opposed to other routes? And, you know, maybe there's the original answer to that that's like practical. Oh, we were able to. So, but But I'm also curious, like, I spend a lot of time now thinking about like what what is this modality that I spend a lot of my time doing and what are we able to do with a podcast around Jewish learning that is not as easy to do in other kinds of learning reading books being in a Torah study whatever like what are what are the strengths of this mode that you have found over these many dozen episodes and also to some extent like how does podcasting play into all the work of taking on that ongoing brokenness and working towards less brokenness? Like, what what are we doing here? How do we do it better? Uh, I think, well, one thing I want to say, though, which may sound like a little thing, but to me, it's an important part of my process is that, um, you know, you mentioned I, I got to a point where I felt like I was ready to teach. I definitely never got to that point. I just had to do it and I did it and I mm -hmm. never got to a point where I was ready. So if anyone out there is thinking about doing it, you're never going to feel ready. You just one day will be trapped doing it. <laughs> um, but as for uh, podcasting as a medium, I think it's 
for for me, I think one of the things we're able to do that that you couldn't do in, for instance, a book or even as much in a class setting is be funny. Yeah, I think our podcast is like 75 percent Talmud, 25 percent humor. And uh, I mean, hopefully, I hope people think it's funny. Um, <laughs> and uh, I think that should that shouldn't be discounted. I think that is that really gives a special flavor to the teaching. And I think it really shapes the kind of space people feel like they're in when they're learning Talmud. Uh, I get to do it with a person live, which I think adds something really special. I think one thing that's really lacking for me is I wish there were more personal connection possible through the podcast medium. You know, I would love to do a Kai, how are you video channel someday where people we can like be making virtual eye contact with people. Part of the power of doing it in a podcast is that we're one level of personal connection higher than print media, uh, but we're still lower than um, video media. At the end of the day, Talmud is actually just sort of incidental to the process. It's mostly an interpersonal process, and Talmud just happens to be the thing that we're doing. What do I think? I think humor and a conversation, um, everyone likes humor and converse, well, most people like humor and conversation, at least both are hopefully approachable to most people. And I think people, including me, enjoy learning from other people that are approachable. And I've always found audio and podcasts more approachable. It forces you to not edit so much. Like if you're doing written media, you can always change every single word and agonize about every single sentence. And to a certain degree, I can edit out some of the things that I say that I maybe was was said in a convoluted way, but I can only really ever remove stuff. I can't really add stuff. It limits what you can do, and, and, and I think that limitation makes it possible for you to fathom creating it. Whereas like a movie, oh my God, I don't can't imagine creating a movie or something like that. This has been so fun, and yeah. I'm thrilled to have been a guest slash host on <laughs> Hi, How Are You? It's been, it's been on my you know, bucket list, and now that is attained. Thank you both for being on, on ours, too. Yes, thanks for having us on. It's been an aspiration of mine to be on Judaism Unbound for a long time. Yeah, thanks for, for having us on. It's very exciting. It's very exciting. More exciting <laughs> than my voice is revealing it to be. Agreed. This was very fun for us too. Very exciting. Very exciting for us too. And uh, we're going to close out in the same way that we always do by encouraging folks to be in touch with us. But before we do, a shout out to the Patreon for Hi, How Are You that helps them keep things going and keep things growing, all that good stuff. You can get to it via a little redirect link that we made specifically for this episode, bit.ly bit.ly slash Chava Unbound. That's X-A-V-A Unbound. So B-I-T dot L-Y slash X-A-V-A Unbound. So we hope that you will go there, support their work. And uh, we also encourage you to be in touch with us at Judaism Unbound if you are so moved. And you can do that in a bunch of ways. First, there is our Facebook page, Judaism Unbound. Second, there is our website, JudaismUnbound.com. Third, there are our social media handles on Instagram and Twitter. All of those are at Judaism Unbound. And last but not least, we love it when you email us. Email us at Dan at JudaismUnbound.com or Lex at JudaismUnbound.com. We also, of course, deeply appreciate if you're able to support Judaism Unbound in addition to Chai, How Are You? And you can do that in a number of ways at judaismunbound.com slash donate, where you'll have the option to donate just as a one-time gift or on a monthly recurring basis. So thank you so much for listening. And with that, this has been Judaism Unbound. <laughs>